Ladies and gentlemen, class, we are extremely fortunate to have with us today the U.S. Attorney General Loretta E. Lynch. Attorney General Lynch received her A.B. cum laude from Harvard College in 1981 and her J.D. from Harvard Law School in 1984. In 1990, after a period in private practice, she joined the United States Attorney's Office for the Eastern District of New York, the city she considers her adopted home. There, she forged an impressive career prosecuting cases involving narcotics, violent crimes, public corruption, and civil rights. In one notable instance, she served on the prosecution team in the high-profile civil rights case of Abner Luima, the Haitian immigrant who was sexually assaulted by uniformed police officers in Brooklyn Police Precinct in 1997. In 1999, President Clinton appointed her to the lead office as United States Attorney, a post she held until 2001. In private practice, Ms. Lynch performed extensive pro bono work for the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda, established to prosecute those responsible for human rights violations in 1994 genocide in that country. As special counsel to the tribunal, she was responsible for investiga investigating allegations of witness tampering and false testimony. In 2010, President Obama asked Ms. Lynch to resume her leadership of the United States Attorney Office in Brooklyn. Under her direction, the office successfully prosecuted numerous cases of corruption, terrorism, cybercrime, and human trafficking, among many more. She is the daughter of Lorenzo and Loreen Lynch of Durham, North Carolina, a retired minister and librarian whose commitment to justice and public service has been the inspiration in her life's work. Ms. Lynch enjoys spending her free time with her husband, Stephen Hargrove, and their two children. The incredible life work of Attorney General Lynch and her commitment to selfless service to our nation is an example for us to emulate and learn from in our future endeavors. It is my distinct privilege to introduce to you the 83rd Attorney General of the United States, Attorney General Loretta E. Lynch. I can take this way for you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Okay. All right. Now, look, okay, this is West Point. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. There we go. There we go. After what I saw in the mess hall today, I knew you could do it. I knew you could do it. Thank you so much, uh, Cadet Arroyo, for that wonderful introduction, that warm welcome. Let me thank everyone here on staff for making me feel so welcome, particularly General Caslin whom I had the pleasure and privilege of meeting earlier this fall at Ring Day. And General, let me say that not only do you have the privilege of leading this outstanding school, you have made it a warm and welcoming place for every visitor who comes here. So let me thank you as well. And thank you for the invitation to address the Cal class of the Cadet Corps. Uh, let me also acknowledge guests that I have with me, my colleague, Bill Baer. He's the Principal Deputy Associate Attorney General. Bill is the number three person at the Department of Justice who's with me here today, here in the front row. Uh, I'm also joined by my husband, Stephen Hargrove, also sitting next to Bill. Um, and so I'm tremendously proud to have my staff with me, particularly Bill and people from his office, because Bill does such an outstanding job of leading the Justice Department's Service Members and Veterans Initiative, one of our most important programs to secure the rights of our men and women in uniform. It is my tremendous and signal honor to stand before you today. It truly is. In this venerable place, I was fortunate enough to have a tour earlier. I've had two, actually, coming in from Newburgh Airport by helicopter and seeing the scope of West Point and what you all are able to accomplish within the sphere that you have here, and then being able to walk through the campus and see not just the buildings, but the history that I know sustains so many of you as you wonder how you will find your place in today's modern military and in this school. This campus, as you know, is unlike any other in the United States, and not just because it's the only one that Benedict Arnold once tried to sell to the British. Few institutions have had a greater hand in molding the United States into the nation that it is today, other than West Point. I was looking at the mural in your mess hall that chronicles military history through the ages, but it also chronicles not just American history, but the history of our civilization, 
the choices that we have made as people, the values that we have determined will prevail and will guide us and will in fact form the context of modern life. Now the alumni from this institution obviously have been leaders for some time. Two distinguished presidents, Dwight Eisenhower, and I believe that Dwight, it was Dwight Eisenhower who said that failing to make the West Point baseball team was one of his life's greatest disappointments. I think he did okay otherwise, but I understand what he meant because this is a very special place. And this is a place where teamwork starts from day one. And of course, Ulysses S. Grant, who wrote in his memoirs that each year at West Point seemed about five times as long as a year back home. Now they may have grumbled a bit about their time here on the Hudson, something I'm sure you've never done. But this much is clear. The path that led them to the highest office in public service began right here at West Point. It's a path that you are also on. And there's no doubt that this institution has a proud and rich history. But West Point is not simply a monument to the past. I mean, the history here is striking, but you are still building, still renovating, of course, with an eye to the future. And you have to. You have to because West Point is the gateway to our future. And that's why I look on all of you with such pride, really, such excitement for what you're about to do because each of you has taken that future into your hands. You've made the step. You've made the choice. When most of you were not yet 18, you made the choice to embark on, the, on an education that demands more of you than almost any other institution demands of its students. You made a choice to forego many of the traditional comforts of college for a more challenging path. And before you could even vote, you made a choice that for at least the next nine years, the watchwords of your life, the watchwords of your existence, would be duty, honor, and country. And that's an enormous testament to your character. And that's a tremendous gift to our nation. And we're grateful for it. And I thank you for it. And I have to tell you that I'm moved by the sacrifices that you've already made and the ones that you've chosen to undertake in the future. We don't know what the future will bring or where it will find you, which theater of conflict you will see. The conflict of my childhood was Vietnam. It's a place that really had no meaning for me until it reached into my life and took members of my family there. And now it's a history lesson that we teach and I'm sure you study here as well. But I still vividly remember my cousins and uncle going off to Vietnam when I was a young girl. And my father, who was a minister, had a family prayer service for them the night before they left. And I remember being struck by the magnitude of their sacrifice, of their choice. And it was the first time I'd ever really known someone who was prepared at a very young age to give his or her life for an ideal, for someone else's freedom. Now their country had called, they had answered, and that was more important to them than their own comfort or safety. And over the years, I watched as other family members, including my own brother, made the choice to serve their country in the armed forces. And their example has stayed with me throughout my adult life. It's never been far from my mind during my years with the Department of Justice. And that sense of sacrifice and devotion to a greater mission that I saw in those young men and which has brought all of you to West Point is perhaps the most important ingredient that I can think of in the creation of a leader. Now I know here you focus on leadership, not only through your regular coursework, but through your extended coursework, the things that you think about and talk about and the ways in which you come together and think not only about leadership, but what it means and how to construct it and how to evolve into one. And another famous graduate of this school, Norman Schwarzkopf once said, leadership, it's a potent combination of strategy and character. But if you must be without one, be without strategy. Because it's the character that you bring to that task that will determine what kind of a leader you will be. And that's what I want to talk to you all about today. Why we need your character more than ever. Now it seems that 
Even though you're here in this wonderful institution and you're focused on your studies and you're focused on your next assignment and some of you are focused on thinking of where you want to go when you ultimately graduate here, I know that you also are all too aware of the world outside. Not just the military call, but the rest of the country and the issues that we're facing. And certainly, as we look at the news cycle, what we frequently are seeing these days are stories of rancor, stories of division, and many of those stories give voice to those raising the question of what kind of leadership we want for our nation. And I believe that the answer to that question can be found right here. It can be found within all of you. It can be found here at West Point. And not simply because of your substantive knowledge or your training to lead one of the most vital institutions in the most difficult of situations, but rather it's because a West Point education is concerned not only with what you know, but with who you are. It's concerned not only with your mastery of strategy, although that's important, but also with your mastery of empathy and your ability to understand those who are starkly different from you, whether they serve in your platoon or whether they sit across from you at a negotiation table. It's concerned not only with your physical prowess, but with the resilience of your moral core. And it's concerned not just with your sterling credentials, although you will gather those, but it's concerned with your resolve to use those abilities to serve others. In short, I believe that your West Point education is giving you the very tools that we need in all walks of life, military and civilian alike. The ability, but also the responsibility to bridge the gap among our fellow Americans. Now it's clear why you are receiving this important and rigorous education. You will lead. You will lead men and women through the most trying of circumstances. And it'll be up to you to show those in your command that their common goals transcend their individual differences. The teams you are forming today will be replicated on fields much more harsh and much more stark. And it'll be up to you to ask those teammates to do things they may not believe themselves capable of doing. It'll be up to you to bring out the best in those that you will have the privilege of leading. And you'll only be able to convince them to do those things when you do them yourself, exactly as you're learning to do here. And when you do that, when you realize that leadership is the ultimate form of service to and for others, then those in your command will surprise you and they will even surprise themselves with the limits or the limitlessness actually of their selflessness with their decency and with their ability to join in a common cause. Now this is precisely the kind of leadership that we need at this moment in our national discourse. And all of you are not only poised, but you are ready to join in. You don't have to graduate to participate in this particular conflict. You don't have to have a degree to join in with the discussion and the debates of the day. You are all ready to lead in our communities, in our homes, because as challenging as your military career will be, and I know that you're learning about those challenges every day, some of your greatest leadership challenges will come when you're out of uniform, in a world that doesn't always exemplify the lessons that you are learning here. And the questions that you will face will be so different from the courses that you have, where you have a formula to follow, or whether you know the reading and the research. How will you lead when a child that you know is being bullied for being different, different in race, different in religion, or different in some other perceived way? How will you lead when someone with whom you disagree needs your help? How will you lead when someone feels ignored or even targeted by the very government that all of us are sworn to serve. People will listen and look up to you, in uniform and out. What will you say to them? What will you do? How will you lead? And those are the times 
when you will truly lean on the lessons of this great institution. The true leaders speak up for those whose voice cannot be heard. They protect the weak from the strong, and they always focus on the common goals and the common principles that bind us together and overcome our differences. Now, I've had a lot of leadership opportunities in my career, and I've been very blessed to have done so. And I can tell you that being a leader often brings fulfillment, it brings recognition, it brings rewards, it is exciting. But I will also tell you that it brings unexpected moments. People, once your peers, may surprise themselves and you by not being completely happy for you, and that will hurt. And along with the acclaim, you will also receive criticism, questioning your decisions, your motives, even your integrity, and that will sting. And although it may be hard to believe, especially for you engineers out there, there will come a time when you will make mistakes. Yes, and disappoint others and yourself. We all fall down. It's how we get up that tells the world exactly who we are, even more than the rank on your sleeve. And how you respond to those challenges will in fact confirm or deny everything that you've said about leadership in less fraught times, because those are the times that you show the content of your character. Those are the times that you have to summon what is best in you, your courage, your integrity, and your honor. And those are the moments that truly count and will ultimately make you the leaders that you will become. Because that's when you realize that leadership focuses not on you, but on the institution that you lead and the mission that it serves. Now in my life, I have been tremendously fortunate that the institution that I've been blessed to lead is the Department of Justice. And the mission is the protection of the American people and the upholding of the rule of law. And in, I will tell you, though, that in my most difficult moments, whether as a U.S. attorney or as the Attorney General of these United States, I've always been well served by reminding myself that my first responsibility is not to what others think of me, but to what my institution can do for others. Now, you have also committed to serving an institution, a venerable and honorable one, the United States military. And I have no doubt that you will use your talents to uphold its proud traditions and to leave it an even stronger institution than you found it. I have no doubt that we will be safer and better people for your service, defending our country, upholding our values. But I have an ask of you today. I have a mission. I have a challenge. I challenge you to consider yourselves also servants of these United States. Because the motto of this institution is not duty, honor, army, although maybe next week it is, on Saturday, December 10th. <laughs> As you all know, the motto is duty, honor, country. And I want you to take that motto seriously. Because the division and the disunity that we now see all too often is symptomatic of a deeper pain in our people, pain that we must learn to heal at a time when rhetoric and ideology divide us and bitterness and mistrust can tear at the fabric of our democracy. We need you. We need you to model service to a larger cause. We need you. We need you to remind us that our responsibility as Americans is to promote the welfare of all of our people, to protect the vulnerable and the weak, and to ensure that the nation that we leave for our own children is better than the ones inherited by our parents. We need you. We need you to bring us back to the heart of our greatness at a time when people are questioning it. We need you to bring us back to the beauty of the different faces and voices and paths that have come together as one people and can do so again. We need you to remind us of what we've achieved together in the early motto of this great country, e pluribus unum, out of many, one. And that's my challenge to you today. That's my mission, 
That's my ask. Be leaders. You already are and you will continue to be. But be leaders not just of our wonderful military, but of our great country. Wherever life takes you beyond West Point, whether it's a career in the armed forces or whether you choose a different path, I challenge you to continue to be servant leaders. Inspire others to serve causes larger than themselves. Bring the lessons of sacrifice, the lessons of selflessness that you have learned outside of these walls. Bring them to our boardrooms, bring them to our classrooms, bring them to children who have never heard of West Point and may not think that they will be inside of its walls. Bring them to the halls of Congress, bring them to government. Show the American people that duty, honor, and country is a motto not just for the proud who pass through the doors of West Point, but for every person in every community. You, all of you, are uniquely positioned to perform this essential work. I know you feel that you're in the middle of coursework now, so much behind you, so much still ahead of you, but people are looking up to you and they will listen to you. What will you say to them? But I have to tell you, as I look out on this outstanding group of men and women, I am filled with such hope. Hope that we will continue marching together towards a brighter future. Hope that we will transcend our divisions and bridge our divides, and hope that our nation's best days still lie ahead. Because I see the leaders in all of you. I see the future in all of you. I see how you have come together out of many, one. The team that you are is the team that we need. People will look up to you and listen to you. What will you say to them? So, let me thank you all for letting me spend a few minutes with you here today. Thank you for this wonderful institution and thank you for this great invitation. I cannot wait to see what you will achieve as the mantle of leadership passes from those of us here on the stage of life on to you. Because you're ready, you're here, and we need you. May God bless you all and shelter your dreams with his everlasting grace. And may God bless all our men and women in uniform and hold their safety in the palm of his hand. And may he continue to bless the United States of America. Thank you so very much. Ma'am, at this time, we'd just like to invite you to chair and take some questions and answers. Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. All right. Hello. <clears throat> so I think we'd like to start this off by just allowing you, if you want to impart anything in the class, uh, aside from your speech. I mean, we're opening up to questions. Um, if anybody asks us questions right now, just notify this person, raise your hand, and I'll call out the number. Um, at this time, do we have any questions? Yeah, number one. Hello. Test one, two, test one, two. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Attorney General Lynch, I'm from a pretty poverty-stricken area, and so I've seen a lot of people turn to a life of crime and a life of drugs. And one thing that concerns me is um, recidivism within the penal system. Mm -hmm. A long time ago, before I joined the military, I was on the wrong side of the law. And a lot of my friends, a lot of my family are still in that area. Mm -hmm. And it's been shown that the way that we can reduce recidivism is increase education, yeah. particularly of inmates. And funding is being cut for this drastically ac across the board, especially with non- um, or I'm sorry, for-profit prison systems. Mm -hmm. What can we do, like at our level, the lowest level, to show support for these people and to decrease recidivism within the penal system? Well, that, that's an excellent question. And I think you've touched 
on one of the most important issues, certainly in criminal justice reform today. And we at the Department of Justice have, agree with you. And we've been working on that. In fact, just yesterday, I made an announcement of significant changes that we have made to the Federal Bureau of Prisons educational system. We've always had educational opportunities within our federal, pro within our federal prisons, but we have realized that they're not as well constructed as they should be. And they are, they are not, they're not even throughout and consistent throughout our system. So we've spent the last several months overhauling the educational systems and offerings within the Bureau of Prisons, and we literally are creating a school district throughout the entire set of institutions where every inmate coming in will get an educational assessment of needs, of issues, because you're right, for every dollar we spend on education within a penal, within a penal uh, system, you save four to five dollars of incarceration costs. So it saves financially, it also saves in terms of the human cost, uh, the people that we lose when they are not in the community, not able to work, not able to get an education. So we've put, in, we've put programs in place that I feel will live on and will in fact uh, improve educational offerings. So not just a GED, but also post-secondary education. Not just a GED also, but looking back at people who have trouble uh, learning how to read in, in terms of remedial education and also identifying learning disabilities. Because you're so right, so often we want people to come out and, and turn over a new leaf, but they haven't been equipped to do so. Now, of course, there's a great deal of concern, I think, as to whether or not policies will change. I do feel that the, the, the systems that we've put in place at the federal level will live on. But most people who are incarcerated are in state custody. They are in state facilities. And they are facing funding issues. They are still using for-profit prisons. We are phasing them out federally. Um, so the issue, and, and the question is, what can you do? You can support educational opportunities in those institutions that don't currently offer them. There are nonprofits and NGOs that are working with, with, with institutions. There are many colleges that are working very quietly to set up programs where they will go into institutions, provide education, and provide college credits. Um, they need volunteers. They need financial support. As you decide how, what, where your donation dollars can go, that does still help. Um, they, as I said, need tutors, they need mentors, they need people to teach English as a second language or to teach basic reading. So there are so many things that can be done, um, but it will require thought and it will require pulling together at the local level to do so. But I thank you for raising that important issue. Number three. Ma'am, in light of the new administration's um, differing positions on some of the things that your office has pushed to promote, like body cameras for police and other kinds of policing reforms, are there any steps that your office is taking to ensure that some of your like, um, most popular reforms live on? Well, again, thank you again for that question. We spent a lot of time working on the issues of the relationship between law enforcement and the communities that we serve. It has been one of my top priorities as Attorney General. In fact, I have, I have uh, been on a community policing tour almost since my first day in office because my literal first day in office was the day that Freddie Gray was funeralized in Baltimore and violence broke out on the streets that same evening. It was the first meeting that I had, uh, it was a topic, I should say, the first meeting that I had with the president. Uh, was how we were going to handle this situation going forward. So in traveling the country and in talking to not just law enforcement, but community leaders, young people, the faith community, about the importance of rebuilding this relationship, many of the programs that we support, such as body cameras and also bulletproof vests, which are, tr are tremendously important in terms of protecting our law enforcement officers, are things that we support through our grant-making programs. Those will continue because many of those applications have already been processed and awarded, and so funds will continue to flow for that. And they, I think that we're also at a point where the efficacy of these, of these programs has been proven. It has been shown, and I think when people were talking about body cameras, for example, initially, people didn't know what to expect. And some people did not know whether it was going to be a complete panacea were we now going to see everything that happened and know where liability lies? And of course, you don't always see everything. Or uh, I think people, some officers were concerned, was it gonna be intrusive and impede their ability to actually carry out 
their public safety mission. And what people have discovered, both law enforcement and community, is that when you have a system of body cameras where you have community input about how they will be operated, where the community knows when they're turned on, how they're managed, how people's privacy is protected, you see a drop in civilian complaints against law enforcement you see situations that still may not be clear, but don't always devolve into violent protest because people know that there will be transparency and accountability. And you see better procedures for dealing with these. So I think that, first of all, the fact that we are funding these programs and rolling out this equipment now and people do not want to give them up gives me great comfort. Also the fact that the, the, the proven efficacy in improving the relationships between law enforcement and communities, I think also is something that means community members will continue to demand this and law enforcement also sees how important they are. But again, it will take people thinking this through at the local level and making sure their voices are heard. So thank you for raising that. Good afternoon, ma'am. It seems like cybercrime has become the way of the present and the, the future. So I was wondering if you could talk about, in general, um, baseline knowledge for the Department of Justice and a uh, way to educate both your department and outreach to the general public. Surely. Well, I, look, I think cybercrime is, is something that essentially is now a part of almost every law enforcement action that we take. It used to be, when I was a young prosecutor in the 90s, we thought of cybercrime as just computer crime. And it was someone, you know, um, someone using a computer in some way to steal identity or something like that. It's so much more than theft of identity, although that is still a key component of it. We, we see large-scale international fraud schemes carried out. We see threats to our infrastructure carried out. Uh, and what I will say is, is that what, what probably keeps most of us in law enforcement up at night are the concerns about emerging between cybercrime and terrorism, um, whether or not state actors who participate in cyber attacks against our economy and against our people will also uh, marry up with terrorists and use it to attack our infrastructure. And so we spend a great deal of time working on these issues. Uh, one of the challenges that we face really is uh, one of talent. Um, it is uh, not just having the, the cyber talent and knowledge in the investigative community, in, a, in the intelligence community, in the military as well, uh, but also um, making sure that we connect with the private sector in terms of explaining the threat profile and, 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 uh, and structure of these threats to them. I am still surprised. I, I will tell you, we, we have a great deal of resources uh, in the FBI with whom I work very closely uh, has tremendous resources uh, devoted to cyber crimes, as do a number of other agencies. And we now have the ability to monitor uh, a lot of different uh, intrusions, uh, for example. And, and the threats to our intellectual property are quite severe, uh, not just the defense industry, but our agricultural industry. Uh, there, there are countries that would, would dearly love to, uh, to get information about newly developing grains that we are doing, because they also are facing problems with food supply. Um, and so we, will, we have the ability to actually see some of these intrusions taking place on systems and networks. Um, and by and large, when we alert companies to the fact that we've seen an intrusion, and it used to be that we would tell them, we've seen an intrusion, it may have happened within the last six months. We now can tell them that it either happened recently or it's ongoing now. Um, and, we, and we still get, um, oh no, that can't be the case because we have an antivirus system. And you're just like, we're so beyond viruses <laughs> at this point. Um, so there's a great need for education in the private sector. There's a great need uh, to communicate the severity of this threat and, the sh and so that we can share information. When we share information about the types of threats that we're all seeing within an industry or across an industry, all of our knowledge is improved. We spend a lot of time working on that. And I think that's something, frankly, that this institution is gonna be a very, very important part of in terms of the training that you all are doing, um, not just at the basic level in terms of engineering and math, but those of you who are focusing on cyber issues and, and are seeing the cyber threat and are seeing the use of cyber in military strategy will be key and will be essential as we move forward in keeping our defenses strong. 
Ma'am, we have time for about one more quick question. Okay. Yeah, number three in the back. Ma'am, we hear you. <laughs> Ma'am, my question is, um, how has the Department of Justice dealt with the legalization of marijuana across many of the states, which is still uh, listed as a Schedule IV drug under yes. federal law? Yes. So this has been one of the challenges for us. Um, and it's been a challenge for a number of years. We, I think certainly in the last election, you saw more states have that issue on the ballot, um, both recreational and, and medicinal uh, marijuana. I think maybe more on the, on the recreational side, which um, I will tell you somewhat mystifies me still. But again, you know, we, we have a system where, where people can make that choice and, and they choose to make that choice. We still have concerns uh, about marijuana. It is still listed uh, on the schedule. The, the scheduling is determinative to, uh, of, of whether or not there is an accept, there's any other accepted use for the product or a medical use for the product. And I'll just say as a separate aside, there are studies going on to determine whether or not there can be some medical efficacy in some of the components of cannabis. And we've all seen that, that there can in fact be poisons that can have medical efficacy. And so there is work going on to determine if uh, we, can ex we can safely extract um, um, medicinal properties from some of the oils within cannabis. Uh, there are some orphan diseases, those, those that don't have a lot of research, that have seemed to have found them very effective. And that will continue, and I think that's something that happens within any number of substances. The states that have chosen to legalize marijuana, particularly on the recreational side, um, raise issues about not just the law enforcement side of it, but the money laundering side of it as well. The banking industry is struggling with how to deal with this also because uh, moving um, proceeds of narcotics trafficking is still against federal law. Um, and so from a money laundering point of view, we've advised um, the banking industry that we still consider that to be illegal. Um, so that has, that has led to um, those states trying to come up with ways to handle the money and the cash hoards that, they, uh, that, they, that this, this business generates without uh, increasing violence. What we have done is we, have, we respect the state's rights to make that choice. We respect um, the, the, the populace's right to vote on a particular issue. But we have said for the past several years that if a state is going to make that choice, we also expect them to have a system in place to prevent the, uh, the harmful aspects of marijuana trafficking. And by that, we mean the violence. We mean access to, of the drug to young children. And we mean um, crossing state lines um, where, for example, the neighboring state may not have legalized the substance. And so we expect state law enforcement to work on those areas. We still enforce the federal marijuana laws where we see large-scale trafficking, where it involves children gaining access to the drug, where it crosses state lines. We've had situations where people have been harmed. Um, uh, one of the problems that we're seeing, in fact, not just with marijuana, but in a host of other um, controlled substances is the potency levels have changed over the years. Um, when I was a young prosecutor, you could look at certain types of narcotics, whether it was marijuana, cocaine, or heroin, and estimate its purity scientifically. Um, now the purity levels are off the charts for all the controlled substances. And so we're seeing more of the negative physical effects of everything. And that is, that is where we still do step in. Uh, but, but to be frank, it is something that we have to do in coordination with those states that have chosen that legalized uh, structure. Thank you so much for your responses, ma'am. Uh, I invite you in flags, in front of the flags, to uh, right. present you with a gift. Well, thank you all for having me, and thank you for your questions. I appreciate your interest, and I can't wait to see what all of you are going to do. Right in front of your works, to the picture. On behalf of the Academy and the Corps of Cadets, we really want to express our gratitude by presenting you with this Cadet Saver. Thank, Thank you for imparting you. your wisdom experience. Thank you. I will treasure this. Thank you so much, ma'am. I'll take so it from much. you and we'll make sure that it gets to you. Thank you so much. We really much. appreciate it, ma'am. Oh.